We're ready to get started back here. So uh, this next topic, our next session is a panel discussion. And so uh, I'll tell you a story. A couple years ago, we had a speaker that canceled about 10 minutes before the conference, before they were supposed to speak. And so we were like, what are we going to do about filling this spot? And I said, I got an idea. So I went in the vendor hall and I rounded up every vendor I could find. And I said, hey, you're on my panel in 10 minutes. And so we, we put together an impromptu panel and it went so good, people started saying, you should do this every year. And so ever since then we have. So here we are at the panel discussion and this is usually a, a pretty fun discussion. The, um, we haven't done it virtually and live yet, so we're gonna see how this goes. We did it in the sleep room yesterday and it went terribly bad. So it's gonna go better today. Um, the panel was good, it was just people online couldn't hear anything we were saying. So. Um, and they didn't get the video either. They didn't get to see our pretty faces. But anyway, so we are going to go through a series of questions here. And first, I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves. I've got a slide here. Um, so if you guys, you guys are going to struggle to see the questions, but I'll read them to you. Um, so, Mr. Gann. I'll start off. Please clap. Yeah, well, you've got to pass the mic down. So I'm Dean Gann, CEO of Aventa LLC. And he is over there. Hi, I'm Joe Lorsky, uh, uh, CUI President of Clinical Affairs for God and Joe Selfie. Hi, I'm Kim Wiles, I'm DTFS for Three Services, and I'll be in Health Network for Medicare. Uh, Lee Bowles, <coughs> Senior Clinical Sales Specialist for Health Trust and I'm Roger Richardson. I'm a manager educator for Vanderbilt University at the Center of Surgery Care. I'm surprised at just how full bloom of a cost center of Paul. All right. Thank you, guys. So, for you guys online, you do have the opportunity to, um, I should talk up in the ceiling. You guys in the cloud up there, uh, you do have the opportunity to ask questions as well. And then at the end, um, if we get any of those questions, then they'll, they'll ask us back in the back of the room. And then if you guys have questions at the end, hopefully we'll have some time to be able to ask, ask those as well. So here we go. The first question, last year when we did this, we talked a lot about respect and just about how the respiratory profession had, had really come to the forefront of what was happening in the pandemic and we've gotten more press than ever before. And so now we're a year later in that. So I just wanted to hear um, from the panelists, what do you guys think about, what's that look like now? Is that still the case? Um, I know that we have a much different situation than last year. We're retired. It's been a long couple of years now instead of just a long year. And uh, so I just wanted to hear maybe from you guys on, on what are you seeing out there? Are we still getting that same press and that same notoriety? Um, and what do you think it's done for the profession? So I believe that the recognition that we should, but I still think there's room for that recognition to improve. Um, do I think, and I know people have gotten raises, are we up to the status of the nurse? Probably not. Do we do a lot with these patients? Absolutely. So I think absolutely we've gotten respect. We've been seeing on the news a lot more than we ever have, but we've got a long ways to go. And I think that not only in our profession, but in our what we do as a profession. So it's not just about taking care of patients in the COVID floors and what we do. We've got therapists in all realms that we need recognized. So, you know, and I'm gonna come from, I'm gonna be selfish, it's all about me right now. From a home care standpoint, we don't get recognized at all. And we're taking care of a lot of COVID patients in the home. So, with that said, I'm gonna pass it to the one. I'm sorry, I got that. What do you call it? Tell them that, perfect, just absolutely perfect. Um, we've gotten a lot of very positive press, but also some press that just does not understand our, our profession. As an example, on CBS about three weeks ago, local in, um, reporter interviewed Craig Brooks and the third commission showed up at Vanderbilt, so that's not one he's with. He's with us. Like, they wanted to in, interview him about the importance of respiratory therapy uh, during COVID, and they did a great interview, Craig did a great job. But they did a sound bite of about 45 seconds on CBS News, and, and it had underneath uh, Craig, he has the highest credentials in education for respiratory therapy. It said ventilator technician. <laughs> so, of course, um, I've been known to be a little passionate. 
Um, so we immediately contacted the, the CBS affiliate and said, this is not correct. You've got to change it on the website. We did. And because of that, the Fox had picked it up uh, at the local place and then did the same type of interview. Then the, the presentation was exactly the same, except the damage red, respiratory care practitioner specialist. And they focused on the special thing that we would not have been successful with Kevin without the respiratory therapy practitioner. And um, Shane was plugged this one and talk about last session today about the importance of language for the respiratory practitioner. So it's the general public doesn't understand unless they have been intimately involved with respiratory therapists at the high level of education and training and specialty. And I'm going to address what you said about not at the, the level of the nurses. We're very fortunate at Vanderbilt that uh, Craig and I report to the, uh, I report to him, he reports to the chief nursing officer of the entire enterprise. And so we are at the table with the nurses and our pay now is almost equivalent to the nurses. So it, it's coming. Thank you guys. Okay, so that leads into our next one, which is staffing. How have your organizations been affected by staffing? Uh -huh. What a loaded question, right? Uh, and could you talk just a little bit about what's that looking like? Um, we're going to have some more questions later on about how do we solve that, but maybe just what's your staffing looking like, um, and what are you guys doing in the immediate to try to cover that? Well, I guess I'm going to make this one again. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a <laughs> so just an example, in, from, from June to August in my company, H&E company, we have employed eight respiratory therapists and a couple casuals. And as of when I come back from vacation, in mid-August, I was down to two staff respiratory therapists. I had two retire because they couldn't take it any longer. I had one decide that he was going to go um, do mountain bikes for Dick's because he wanted out of it again. I had somebody who took a management position, and I had someone take, um, I don't know if I'm getting old or not, I had someone take a bar shift, and um, I had somebody else that wanted to go to babies again. So that left us with a completely critical level of staffing. We were down to two, with, and myself. Now, I'm not going to enroll being out in the field a lot, so I had to do a lot of learning again because you really want to put me out on a ventilator when I haven't been out there for a long time. So it was a very quick, very quick learning, and basically what we did is we took care of the day-to-day -day needs of the patients. Um, so the new orders that were coming out, we, we could handle. Um, we brought in a couple of temporary casual RGs that I've known to help me out, <laughs> thank goodness. Um, we have other staff, but they're not out there. We have several school, schools in the Pittsburgh area, and we've always had an abundance of respiratory therapists. And when I would adver advertise for a therapist, we would usually get around 20 applicants. I am not getting any. So the staffing shortage is real. Um, I never thought I would get to this point in my career, but the staffing shortage is real. Yep. Thank you. I'll address, it. I'll address it from the hospital large and academic, and I've said Bendy Brook Health because uh, over the past two years we've acquired three local community hospitals that were integrated together, and it's been wonderful to work together. So I'm not only speaking for a 1,200 bed academic medical center, I'm speaking for those local regional hospitals that are 120 to 180 beds, which we all may be practicing at. And the staffing shortage has been as, as painful as I've ever seen it. Uh, Craig joined Vanderbilt. My boss uh, joined Vanderbilt 17 years ago as a traveler. And this year is the first time since he joined us that we've had to reach out to get travelers. And it's not so much been related to staff leaving us, but it's really related to the increase of our practice responsibilities. Uh, we have done things that are uniquely different because we've gone from uh, X to Y, a 30 to 40 percent increase in our acuity, and we've added 28 intensive care beds, and our local hospitals have done the same thing just for COVID. And that, so what we've done is uh, needed more staff because of the acuity of the patient. We used to staff based upon number of ventilators. We no longer do that in the unit. We look at the diagnosis and acuity of the patient because working with a COVID ventilator um, takes four or five times longer than a narrow ventilator patient that's had a ventilator and we the as a simple example. Um, we've been fortunate because of this crisis in my organization is that we have significant 
two market increases, and I think that's brought us even maybe higher than some of the nursing salaries because of the importance of what we do. Um, but back to the school situation, we have zero pipeline in all of our hospitals with the first with your practitioners and the school. I'm shamelessly been hustling here uh, for their best, but, um, but it, there's the supply and demand problem that we have. Our local universities cannot ramp up quick enough because they don't have the professors, they don't have the accreditation to take larger classes. And we're just at a maturation of an industry, which is a positive thing. But when we're seeing more people as you have retire and, and the pipeline is not there. So what we're going to do at Vanderbilt to accommodate those acuity patients, we're going to take the lower level respiratory therapy and we're going to train the nurses who are already at the bedside to do that. And that's heretic to talk about giving up aerosol therapy. That's my job. It's really not. When you look at the law and you look at what our practice is, we should be practicing at the highest level of our law. Uh, and I know you've had to do that at home here because you, you only get paid for so much. So I don't want to talk all the time, but um, I would encourage everybody to reach out in their community and be uh, an evangelist for this profession because it is uh, highly important and highly uh, impactful in the community. We need to get more students, more people aware, and start <coughs> calling by the right name. We are respiratory care practitioners. So thank you. And can you guys talk a little closer to the mic? They're struggling to hear online. I'm going to have a word real quick before the mic. I'll take it back. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah, I'll get it back. Right. Okay. I, I want to address one thing with that too. Is we, we've had some, some some loss in our business as well with, with therapists going to do other things. But I've heard a couple of really good ideas here today and, and or yesterday and today. And one was for and it's not an immediate fix, but for the DME companies, there probably would be a, a really wise thing to do would be to reach out in the community and to the, and try to help with some of that positive publicity try to help recruit students to start coming into the program and give it a real positive light on what the, what the profession is about. And nothing bothers me more than to see these Facebook posts where kids will put on there that they're considering going into respiratory therapy and they'll have somebody come on and bash the field about how it's a dead end field and you know we're not treated with any respect and whine, whine, whine. And, and as y'all all know, respect is not something that comes with your diploma. That comes up with something, there's something you earn, you got to work for that. And so I, I get curious about that, but I've heard several good ideas. Some some people are talking about offering scholarships uh, to try to help get people to come into the field, send them to community college, it doesn't cost that much to do it, but that would create some real loyalty. Again, it's not a quick fix, um, but I agree with brother with what you're saying, we need to be practicing at the highest level of our license. And, We've said for years, and as I've said it in conferences, I've said it, is that we need to be more in that highest level, more of a consulting um, high-level practitioner. Some of the mundane things we do um, can be passed off, and, and that doesn't mean we don't need to have some oversight to it, but at the same time, why couldn't we pass some of that off to people that are already there? So I, I agree with everything y'all were saying, and I just add that to it, and I'll give you back to So y'all are one. <laughs> so just to piggyback off of that, the, the pay rates have obviously skyrocketed in a lot of places. And I think that one of the challenges that we've seen in, in post-acute care is that it's really hard to compete with hospitals, and uh, almost impossible. And so if you don't have loyalty and, and people that stick around because they love what they do, and it's hard to compete. So I just wonder if, if anybody wants to talk to that. And by the way, we're going to get to some sniff questions, so you'll get your shot in there. And then we'll get to some home care questions, too. Uh, but anyway, just if anybody wants to talk to that about, are these rates sustainable? You know, we want to, we want to see the profession grow. Uh, we want to see our, our rates get, we want to see us, ourselves get paid as much as nursing. But at the same time, if it's not sustainable long term, what does it do to the profession? <coughs> Of our 
are, and we are funded by payers, and we can't adjust this. So we did bump people up a lot. I mean, some five and six dollars an hour, we tripled our on call pay. Um, so we have really come up. I am hoping, quite frankly, it's sustainable. It depends. It depends how the industry goes. Are there going to be more cuts to our area? And I completely agree with what both of you said about practicing up. There are things that we do in DME that we really should be doing. We could be handing that off. And we've already had meetings on that within our organization on some things. And I think I will get a little bit of pushback. But if you really look at it, we should be practicing up. And I, I hope that we can sustain it. And I think the way we do sustain it is we pull these activities away and give them to people that can do them and can do them well. I can tell you that the traveler pay is not sustainable. Uh, I'm gravely concerned about it when I'm here in, in my network of hospitals, friends who are saying, well, 50% of our staff is traveling and traveling in some parts of the country in 185 $200 an hour with an organization having to pay a travel company and then the uh, traveling RP gets that. And it's wonderful that they have that kind of income. But it's just not the same world in our healthcare organization. So what we are planning to do, instead of trying to hire more practitioners or do a travel company, because it's just not affordable and it doesn't make good fiduciary sense. It's just not responsible because we have such limited dollars as our payer system do. Any any of you work for any organization in healthcare that's funded by uh, the reimbursement system that we're in. So once again, we're getting it go like a reiterating this again, but we are going to set up practice for our practitioners, do assessments on a 24-hour basis, and then the heirs out there just turned over to the care partner or the nurse at the bedside. That's one simple example. We also, nobody can tell me, why do we do two four-hour, two two or two six-hour dental checks? The last time I asked that in our department was, well, because it's for safety, we want to make sure the doctor hasn't uh, put them on something that said, well, the doctor shouldn't be touching your ventilator. Uh, we that's been our practice. So when, when I did a ventilator audit recently, I was stunned at looking at are we doing Q4 hours and why are we doing Q4 hour checks. We were not touching those patients Q4 hours. We were touching those patients almost every hour. But I can tell you, our staff at 11 o'clock, I'm like, gotta have them do my second rounds. Why? You were just in there. But we've got to get away and we need to practice more like a nurse practitioner in the care team. You see the patient once a day, you see the patient as they're needed, not doing rounds in the traditional way of oh, two, four hour aerosol. And but that's how we're going to have to practice up because the, the reimbursement rates will not be sustainable to travelers. But if we can prove our value, as Mr. Dan said yesterday, in this lecture, we have to prove our value, our cost value. And we're not going to be able to prove it by giving aerosol therapy that's no longer being first. We can lower the cost of health care if we get Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Thank you guys. Oh, man. Thank you. Okay. So what do you think 2022 looks like? We talked about there's a shortage of respiratory therapists coming into the profession. And I think, Roger, you mentioned that to me. I know calling you out again, but you mentioned that to me that even the schools right now, the numbers are way down. And, and I think from my perspective, it seems like because there's so much negativity, like you said, Gene, um, that people are scared to go into healthcare and scared to go into fields that, that are so, if they hear all this negativity and they hear all the, the horror stories and they see it on the news, and even though we've got more press, we've got less and less people coming into the profession, which is creating this funnel and a much bigger problem. And so what do you think 2022 looks like? And then beyond that, yeah, I can only speak for the Middle Tennessee region, and we are affiliated with all of the um, associates that we have one bachelor's program, and all of those programs, are, their enrollment is down by 30 percent. Um, and usually of the enrollment, they only have about 80 percent of their enrollment that graduates and pass the boards. So in reality, for 2022, 23, and 24, I'm predicting that, that we've got about 50 percent reduction our historical pipeline of students. So, uh, unfortunately, um, we're going to, I believe, we're going to have to do something.
the unique, whether that is uh, for this part of the country, recruiting people in, doing deposits of, of states with no income tax or, or something, but uh, I'm, I'm greatly concerned about it, but we're going to, once again, have to give up the things that don't bring value. What's this point? Okay. Oh, <laughs> I got enough trouble. Please don't recruit from us. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, wait. I, I can go to Philly. Okay, yeah, you go. I can go to Philly. Um, no. So I sit on the advisory board for our local university, <laughs> and we are down 30% of the So, and we graduate about 80% of the students. And we have a high population of uh, Saudi Arabian students that go back to their country. So mm -hmm. those numbers are even skewed a little bit further because we don't get them in our workforce, but they, we're training them to do good in their country, but when they're not staying in the workforce. So um, with that said, we, we've got low numbers. And you know, I know that's only one of our colleges, and we have a couple other colleges within with our area, and I imagine we're probably all feeling about the same. So I spent a lot of time looking at what's gonna happen in 2022 from a different perspective. Um, supply and demand. So, we, you know, as we're trying to predict what the impact of the pandemic will be over the, over the next year, and I can tell you this, in, in retrospect, looking back, we've been wrong in every assumption we've made <laughs> about when we think this is going to peak, when we think we're going to see the end of this. Um, right now, you know, we, we just read, right now, in our, in our business in manufacturing, the lead times to get materials and components to make the respiratory devices is now out in some product lines, it's 18 months. So we have to, we have to think about today what I need to order for a year and a half from now. When you talk about rare components like the PC board components, and the fiddles gas know this as well, and uh, anybody in our space, um, but even simple materials, right, because we're competing against the, uh, you know, the rest of the world for wires and, and motors and electronics and uh, you know, capacitors and little things like that. So uh, on the respiratory front, you know, uh, just a couple comments on that. So we believe, at least the way we're projecting out, and we look at it from a global perspective because we sell in 80 countries, probably a little more than 80 at this point. Um, and, you know, right now there's, there's big spikes of, of breakthrough infections happening in Germany. There's big spikes of breakthrough infections happening in the UK. Um, this isn't, this is with us forever. It's, in, it's already transitioning from pandemic to endemic. Um, the question is how do we live with it and manage it better? And, and that's what we're all still trying to figure out. So we're projecting a 2022 that looks like a slightly dampened 2021. We don't see a whole world of change going on next year. Uh, we think that, you know, I, I don't know if you guys are having the same conversations in your world, but there's a, there is some seasonality to this. It's not a seasonal virus per se, but the reason we have seasons is because of the behaviors, right? We go indoors. So we're seeing spikes in the northern states, just like we're seeing spikes in the northern countries in Europe, as they move back indoors, right? So there's more close, uh, close contact, close interactivity. Typically when we see RSV, it's typically when we see flu, historically. So um, it, it's never going, it, it's, it's a coronavirus, number one. This is, there's thousands of variations of coronavirus, and they're always here, they're ever present, they're like a needle virus and many of the other viruses. So it's not going away. On the, on the clinician front, and as a respiratory therapist, um, I started in home care in 1990, when, when, and in 90, when you went to home care, people said, oh, you couldn't get a job in a hospital. Mm -hmm. Like you were blackballed. So talking about lack of respect, we were clearly riding in danger field for my, for my answer. And part of the reason I published the papers I did was to prove that I was just as smart as my colleagues working in the hospitals and I could do things just as unique and just as clinically sound and built, built my home care company business around that concept. So we've, we've had a shortage of respiratory therapists off and on for, since I've been in the profession. We are if you look at some of the AERC studies on our age group, more of them will look more like me than look like a millennial. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at retirement, uh, as, we, as we were talking about when we were retiring uh, completely. Uh, over. And so the schools are, I also sit on the advisory board of the community college and respiratory uh, program, enrollment's down. Enrollment typically, historically, we follow the economy. 
So when the economy was bad, and one would go up. When the economy was good, and one would go down. Uh, nobody wants to work right now. So just so you know, there's sort of just, like I employ in my facilities engineers, accountants, product managers, uh, quality specialists, all kinds, and we can't find anybody. And, uh, and so it, the, it's a very difficult and unique time in the country. I, and I think that the, the working to the top of our, our profession is going to be critical. I've sat in, I've done the ARC board a couple times. I've sat in many debates around letting go of the little stuff. But so many departments for so many decades defined the role of the therapist by the number of aerosol treatment cards they carried around. We have incentive spirometry instructions they were doing. You know, the O2 checks, if you think ventilator rounds, ventilator rounds are stupid, O2 checks are even dumb. I mean, um, and so we, we did a lot of non-value added activity. And that's why we, I believe that's why we didn't earn the respect that we always wanted and deserved. Because we were operating at the bottom and we were protecting it on top of it. <laughs> you know, I would go home and set up somebody who couldn't read English, an aerosol machine, and meet them, and they were doing every two, four hour aerosol treatments. But in the hospital, they had the respiratory therapist. <laughs> and I never, you know, when I got home care, I could change. So I do think, to Gene's point, we need to be the clinical specialists at the top of the pulmonary food chain who are the, who are the subject matter expert technologists. Because the technology, the technology is very complicated. If you ever read some of the studies, like most people can't even interpret the waveform on a ventilator, that they keep making more of them. Because ventilator companies love to make fancy belts and whistles, but, but the average therapist, the average pulmonologist, they can't even interpret the waveforms. So I, I think we do need to spend more time as the clinical subject matter experts, and that means there's going to be less of us in the long run. There's already going to be less of us because less people are entering the profession and more people are exiting. So to your point, I think that this is the time, as Gene pointed out, and others, that um, you start to break out and become the practitioner that we, we really should be. And you know, that's one of the things that attracted me to home care was I, I was the subject matter expert every time I walked into a ventilator patient's home or into, you know, when I was setting up something complex, infant on a tray, and all the cool stuff that, we, that I got to do in the course of that part of my career. And we were the subject matter experts. And then you were the reimbursement expert and the social worker and about 10 other things while you were in the patient's home. But that's where we need to, to focus. And I think it's going to require, we can't get all that done in a two-year degree. So we're going to need to continue to push for advanced training from associate to bachelor's, bachelor's to master's, just like all of our other professionals. One of the, we, we fought, every time I was on the board at the ASU, we fought over, should we make higher degrees are required. And every time we lose that fight, because about half the board members were um, program directors of community colleges. So they don't want to, it's a conflict of interest, right, to, to suggest. But if you look at the time I've been a respiratory therapist, pharmacy went from a bachelor's degree to a pharma, PharmD. Speech therapy went from a bachelor's degree to a PhD. Physical therapy went from a bachelor's degree to a PhD. Audiology went from a bachelor's degree to a PhD. And we are focused still around community colleges and fighting on bachelor's side. So I think we're going to have to be comfortable with the idea of escalating this business to have part of it. This, I'm sorry, Dave. No, it's a great point. I just need to we'll take 10, 15, OK, 45 seconds, please. Um, <laughs> no, but your point is that I teach modes of ventilation for Vanderbilt School of Nurses, nurse practitioners. Um, and I've done that for three or four years. This year, when I went in for this very long course curriculum, I said, okay, what's our makedown of nurse practitioners, BS nurse practitioners, practitioners, and doctor level? Oh, we no longer have a BS program in nursing. All nursing programs have been built now is a nurse practitioner or a doctor level. So nursing has just made the impact that you just talked about physical therapy. Nursing is not doing it. So it is imperative on us to set a standard, not, not that we're degrading anybody, and I was a CRT, very successful CRT with an AS degree for years and years and years. All of us. When I was, yeah, but the point is, with technology and accreditation of online programs now, there's no, I, I didn't do it for years and years because I, I chose not to do it because I couldn't go in a brick and mortar. And I'll talk about that too, but we have an opportunity electronically to give doctoral degrees and we should take advantage of it. I'm 46 seconds up. <laughs>
We'll just keep that mic because I got a question, another hospital related question before we go to post two, which is next. But um, I think that we all know that respiratory therapists have struggled, healthcare professionals have struggled over the last couple of years. And so I just wonder if you could tell us how are your respiratory therapists? I, I think I talked, I cried about this yesterday, which I wasn't going to do. Um, well, I swore I wasn't going to do it. And just, I, I told the story of the stress that they've been under, and I, I, I've seen it over and over, and I've worked the night shift uh, just recently, which was very beneficial to the story that I told yesterday, but they are compartmentalizing to a point that I'm very concerned about their emotional and mental health. An uh, example of the night, that I didn't share this yesterday in my presentation, but the night shift that I work, uh, one of my ICU colleagues, MICU colleagues, in 12 hours lost six COVID patients they've been working with for about three to four weeks. And that one particular night, every two hours, she lost a COVID patient. And, uh, and it's, 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 it's concerning. And I'm fortunate to work for an organization that has a great employee uh, relation, employee health benefit assistance program. But we, the stats are that nobody's taking advantage of it. There's a stigma related to that that I, I can't do that because this is my job and it, it's affecting our emotional health. Um, and I'm very concerned if we don't change our practice that we will have more exodus because of the emotional mental breakdown. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing some, some hostility in within the department that I've never seen before. And it's all because of stress. It's all because of the way that our brains are functioning. And so uh, I think we all have to have a little more patience, a little more understanding. And we need, we need to be vulnerable. And that's, that's not who we are as a fact that, you know, we, we cover the entire hospital. And, it's interesting that fields that you were talking about, PTO2 speech, and even nursing, none of them compared to us when you're a single practitioner covering a small community hospital and you, you touch every patient. You're at the patient when they are born and you're at the bedside when they die. None of the other practitioners are when you can do a grid with the spinach makes us stand out. Um, related to ethics, related to politics, is that we have such a broad range of language because we've been there at first and we're, we're at the death. And that's not true for PT, speech, or OT, but yet they require a doctorate level. So what's wrong with this picture? That was so, I, I'm an example, I'm, I'm, I'm a mess. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so moving on to post-acute care, and let's talk about skilled nursing facilities for just a minute. Um, how has COVID-19 affected respiratory care in the skilled nursing facility? And then maybe also you touch on the reimbursement changes a couple of years ago, and, and how has that affected respiratory care in the skilled nursing facility? I, I feel like I got set up on that. <laughs> I'm just kidding about the mic uh, so, so the effect on skilled nursing facilities, obviously, if y'all all saw um, the devastating uh, activities that we went on in nursing facilities across the country, uh, it was very sad to see we lost a lot, a lot of people uh, in nursing homes uh, as a result of COVID. Um, we had the, the good fortune or the fortune of the, of the opportunity, I'll say, I don't think it was good fortune, but it was COVID related. But when the COVID outbreak initially started and the Department of Health uh, received a big influx of federal money to, to try to bolster our, our system a little bit, uh, we were asked by the Department of Health to develop a COVID-specific nursing home program, uh, which we did. And so we, as respiratory therapists, were asked to design it and to implement what the rules should be in that for these facilities to receive this extra money, uh, including money to buy equipment and, and to do staffing and uh, all those things. Um, one of the things we required, first thing we required, was that they have a respiratory therapist at least eight hours a day on any COVID unit on any nursing home. Uh, these nursing homes were setting up uh, 10 to 20 bed facilities that took mostly patients that were coming from the hospital that had been, so we were trying to relieve beds and we had that to it. That was our major focus, was how can we relieve the ICU beds, how can we get these patients out. So we had the, we had the opportunity to do that and it was very successful. Uh, it lasted during the first wave, then it stopped and all of them shut down. 
And I'll be dang that a few months later we didn't get the call again. Let's crank them back up. So we had to go back to that. Now, staffing in that situation was extremely hard because you were talking about we want to hire you for eight hours a day, but only for a couple months. And, and that was a real tough competition. Luckily, the facilities that did most of these units already had respiratory therapists on board. Um, and we were lucky to have most of those respiratory therapists who had families who realized that the big money wasn't the only thing in life. Their family was important and their, you know, their stability was important. So, um, what was the next part of the question? <laughs> um, the, the reimbursement. Okay. Yeah. The reimbursement changed right before COVID hit and now pays for respiratory therapy services that are included in ancillary services, which now is paid for in the skilled nursing facility. So uh, it kind of got blinded by COVID over the last couple of years, but how has that changed the SNF market? And do you think that will continue to change? I do. Prior to the COVID situation, right after that happened, we were seeing that influx of facilities calling wanting to acquire respiratory therapy because they knew the review was going to be up and they could get paid for that. So that was a big change in the market. Um, so we are talking about the the, uh, the shortage of therapists right now in the hospital is tremendous. And the loss of going to, to travel positions is a big part of it. But we're also gonna see in the future, in the near future, a loss from the hospital side to going into long-term care. And there's also gonna be opportunities like with our company, we, we do quality oversight for insurance companies. We employ about 25 plus three there. We will be looking for more. So there's going to be that increased competition too. Um, so I think it's going to be impactful, but I know that for the next three to four years, we are all going to struggle. There's no doubt about it. We are going to, we are going to have to shine the next three to four years and seek every opportunity we can to keep that publicity up, to keep it positive, to make sure that it's the, the right publicity in, in every community. And I encourage all y'all, if you have an outlet, reach out to that outlet and try to get some kind of press going for your, for your organization or for yourself, for your profession. The other thing is, uh, and Zach and I talked about this a little bit, it's, it's a little off the subject, but it's on the subject too, is keep in mind every day that things that you say, things that you do are very impactful to people long into the future. Um, I, I have you know, been so excited so many times to see people that I hired uh, as you know, 18 year olds, 19 year olds, not only as respiratory therapists but in the ME world who are now managers and who have you know, top jobs in an organization they come to see and they, they've done so well. Um, even in the stream, I have one. <laughs> He became a great respiratory therapist uh, that worked for me at a very young age. So the impact you make, you may not even know about it, but sometimes it comes back to you and it is a good feeling to see that happen. So keep that in mind too. Thank you. Don't give the mic away yet. One more question. Uh, so what about the ventilator units in the skilled nursing facility and LTAX? How has that changed during COVID? Uh, obviously, we see more ventilator patients in the hospital. Are we seeing more patients in that environment? Or also, because of the rule changes, are we seeing less uh, less patients in that environment? We we did see an uptick in the patient population and the skilled nursing facility, you know, the facility nursing on ventilator units. But it was a small uptick. Uh, primarily, the patients that were that bad for that long, as, as you know, passed away. Um, the patients that were long haul ventilator dependent patients, uh, we immediately made them an exclusion from our lean criteria uh, because we didn't know, we had no idea. It's like, how do you plan for all this? What's the outcome going to be of these patients? So we, we put them into an exclusive category that we didn't know if we are going to be able to lean or not. Uh, luckily, the, the patients that have come in, we've been successful in getting along for them. Uh, a lot of them have long-term illness that still requires some, some assistance. Um, and again, that goes to the home care side of things and what are we gonna do with these more sicker patients that we really don't know enough about their long-term prognosis to, to be affected. Um, but as we go forward, uh, the need for long-term ventilator units is gonna increase dramatically in the country. 
there's no doubt. Um, one of our goals and one of the ARC's goals primarily is to make sure that respiratory care is delivered at all levels that it is needed. And right now, in skilled nursing facilities and later units outside of Tennessee, I can tell you that that's not the case. Um, they have very poor situations in many, many states. Uh, I talked about, and I hope nobody from Texas, I don't think they're danger, but they have a terrible program in Texas. Um, you have two or three ventilator units that have 60 or 80 ventilator dependent patients and respiratory therapists there eight hours a day, seven days a week. Well, what do you do? Um, one therapist for 80 patients eight hours a day is not going to produce any outcomes. Um, and, and these patients are just in a horrible state. There needs to be a lot of improvement there. Um, the state of Ohio, we end up in insulting body, but the respiratory therapist has to be on call. That's all they have to have. They've got to be on site eight hours a week. Eight hours a week. Yeah, and on top. Yeah. So that's that's their new requirements. That was before it was nothing. Um, but they're getting paid big money and not require anything they have no outcome. So if y'all heard my talk yesterday, we're looking at a, at a accreditation program for this type of ventilator unit, a national accreditation program. And the very first standard of care will be that they have 24 hour respiratory therapists at a ratio that's appropriate for the patient's care, which is about a one to 10, one to 10 airway uh, presence. Uh, that's gonna put more strain on us, but again, we all know that that's gonna be the next four or five years for us. And again, I encourage all of you to reach out and be an ambassador for the profession. I'm here to do the best the right thing to do, yeah. the ratio. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what about telehealth? We've seen a lot of telehealth movement since the pandemic started. A lot of professions jumped all over telehealth. Physician community obviously is doing a lot more telehealth. Um, what have you guys seen from a telehealth perspective? <laughs> I'll do a little bit. Uh, we, we have a population health program, uh, population health and management program, and we had approximately a thousand patients at the time of COVID hit. And we immediately went to a telehealth model. And believe it or not, our outcomes barely changed. They really didn't change at all. Uh, and I believe that is the way of the future. I, I, it, it's one of those things that is so crazy. It took so long and so much fight to get it approved and to get it paid for. And then when COVID came, all of a sudden it's the golden magic bullet, you know. And I think it's going to stay. So we're going to see more and more telehealth. Again, an opportunity for us is you can see a lot more patients with a telehealth problem than you can if you've got windshield time and drivers going to patients' homes and that kind of thing. It will raise the bar 
uh, it may not create more facilities right out the gate, but it will create a better product uh, and a higher quality of all of them. We also scrambled to get setups, CPAP. Um, so basic CPAP setup. So we did implement very quickly what we call a virtual visit program. And that really has been very successful, quite frankly, because we can actually do eight virtual visits in one day versus three traveling to the patient's home with the patient satisfaction still there. So when we first implemented it, we did see a slight decline in our overall 90-day compliance. So we were at about 86% overall compliance, and we dropped uh, to 78%. So we are back up into the 80% range, but we have tweaked it a little bit, and we continue to tweak it all the time. So when we first started it, because we implemented it so quickly, it was all done via telephone. So like, come on, guys, these people want to see us in person. So let's implement, let's use our Teams, let's use our, our Zoom, and that's how we, um, we get that accomplished. So, our 30-day compliance isn't the best, I will tell you, because by the time you ship the unit out and then get the patient on for virtual visit, sometimes they either don't use it until they get it, which we don't recommend, but we do have instructions in there, or um, they wait. So our 30-day compliance is low, which is what we're working on right now, but our 90-day compliance continues to climb, so I'm, I'm happy with it. And a lot of the days are instituted from our program, sleep coaches and that type of thing. Instituted more follow up as you say, where they're calling the patients, following up. Uh, as we talked yesterday, in the form of the sleep side. The more education you do, the, the better increase you have in compliance across the board. Uh, so, um, with our PAMS program, we've actually seen an average of around a 15% increase uh, for patients who have gone into using that. And a lot of them have gone took our program to develop their own. So for, from a, a home care perspective, how do you think that home care companies are going to have to shift their strategy over the next several years? Because obviously we're hearing that we don't have as much staffing, we don't have as much of a pipeline, we've got all these challenges with trying to keep staff. So when, when we start shifting towards doing more value and, and less volume, what does that look like and, and what are d and companies going to have to do to be able to compete in the market going forward? I think they absolutely, and we've talked about this before, have to practice up. Because I can assure you there, I'm going to say this before, there are many things that we do because if we just inherited it within the field that really could be done by a trained individual. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, some of the things, if we're doing virtual visits and not touching the patient on the phone, can we educate those patients on CPAP with a, with a highly trained individual that's not an RT? And you assign the RT if there's questions regarding um, RDIs and HIs and some clinical questions, then you pull in the RT. I don't know, it's a lot. But I think we've got to really start looking outside the box because we don't have the people there to do it. So if we, if we don't think outside the box and try to implement some of these new, um, new pathways of thinking, then we can stop. Well, not only staffing about that, about, but COVID in general. Uh, our patients didn't want to come into an office. They didn't want someone coming into their home. Uh, so there are a lot more remote technologies, a lot of changing pressures, a lot of uh, touchless setup, everything in that aspect. And we just see the therapists move up to higher acuity with non basic ventilation and take care of those patients in home and have them to sleep where we should. Uh, now, we are at limitations depending state by state who can set up a CPAP. So there's still limitations to that. There's questions about well, what does this do set up? Pressure is okay. Well, I can have an RTX to set pressure, but we can still get some education. We just definitely keep the education level high as we do that. And make sure it's just that we've got a trained individual that can answer those questions and then maybe triage it. And if it becomes more severe, then it, it moves back to the therapist and then maybe require more. Well, I think, and I think part of that is with the technology that we have to monitor compliance and we have the technology to see are they having central events are they do they need changes in their ventilation modes are they meeting their tidal volumes or are their max pressures being met so those are the things that we could have a therapist just 
focused on that because now they're looking at this. Yeah, we need training on waveforms probably. There's many areas we talked about that earlier. We do need we do need some training, but I think that's practicing up because now we're interacting with the physicians. We're talking with them, you know, um, recommending ventilation. You know, talking to patients how to insert a humidifier into their CPAP, plug it in, open the container. Is that really practicing up? That is standard, just step by step um, procedures that are out there. And heck, I mean, I hate to say it, but you can. Do it. It's in the app. It's in the app. And in all the devices, you can go onto YouTube, and there's a gentleman on there that's from Australia that will tell you how to set pressures and set up every single unit out there. Do I think setting pressure should be a therapist? Absolutely. Absolutely should be a therapist setting those pressures. He's, he does tell you a lot. Yes. Have you seen these videos? I just want to go. Those manufacturer side. We all have those videos. Yes. We all yes. Have our own Yes, and they all have their apps that, that talk patients through that if they are struggling. So, you know, the, the technology is there. We just need to utilize it and use our therapist in the right lane. So just, just an observation. I mean, I, I, the home care industry, particularly the DME industry, is a, in the big picture, it's still a relatively young profession and field, and it's evolving. And, and as, as you look at any dis historically for any business or business model, as you go through a maturation, you go through a lot of change. You see consolidation. You see movement away from non-value-added activities, which is how we define ourselves. So I think just like the hospitals are going to have to think about giving up, you know, low low end things that we embraced to justify our staffing 15 years ago, like aerosol treatments and incentive spirometry and chest PT and a lot of those things, to being more you know clinically focused, intellectually focused care that, that requires the skills and knowledge of, of, a, of a higher trained practitioner. And in home care, it's going to be a mix of technology as a solution, and that's where we put the, with what most of the manufacturers are doing around all med tech, not just home care is making the devices smarter and the devices more capable so that you can eliminate a lot of non-value added activity around that so you can focus on, on the clinical care. Home care is going to face the same thing. The biggest challenge that you have in DME that differs from a lot of other spaces at the moment is the reimbursement system is set up just for the equipment and it keeps going down. It hasn't gone in the right direction for a long time. And until we can unbundle the product from the therapy, uh, and, and start getting some compensation for the therapy, it's going to be a struggle. And we've gone at that a few different angles over the years and trying to get direct payment for respiratory therapy and stuff, and it's, it's always ended up at a dead end because we're not a profession in the statute within CMS and in the law. We don't exist as a, we're not at the same level as a physical therapist. Part of that is the minimum requirement is a bachelor's degree to be professional in the eyes of the government. So I'm not saying that's my personal belief, but that's the way the, the statute is set up. So until we until we com get comfortable that we have to give away some of these non-value added, <coughs> I, when, I, when I had my own home care company and things got busy and big, I, I was very informed about the respiratory care law in my state. And basically my rule of thumb was if a therapist doesn't have to do it, they shouldn't be doing it. And we can train a tech, we can train a, you know, we can train staff to do these other value-added, you know, activities like certain education, technical support, technical education. So I was, I wanted my therapist, therapist, to help, and I wanted everybody else doing the other stuff. And if it didn't require a license to do it, I didn't want to waste any time doing it. And, and and that's how we kind of differentiated the professional side of the business from the technical side of the business. Mr. Pan, I hope we aren't taking enough time on this one question, but I want to tie it all together because what we've been talking about is two swim lanes here that are very parallel and very important. So it's not only our practice act at the state level from a, from a legal standpoint, but our federal laws. They're, they're, I cannot overemphasize enough, and I know we probably have people at home from different states and not just Tennessee, but I was honored to be with Colleen and Candy when we originally in 1986 got our uh, practitioners act passed. But if we had to write that that, that law today, it would be completely different because of the technology and the things that they are And so we got that law through the legislation, with the legislators, very easily because it was from patient safety and we had lots of cool kind of stories to tell and that no way. But it's changed and, and, and our state lawmakers and our federal lawmakers 
they will listen to the constituents. If you're not active with your local state legislators, you should be. And that goes back to with raising up the awareness, let's keep our profession in the spotlight and talk about it. And then at some point in time, we will have to have a bachelor's degree. And I have practitioners I trust my life with that have been in the field 40 years. And they're smarter than any of the physicians that I work with on, on our field. But we've got, a, we've, got, we've got an issue to have an inflection point to get there. But keep in mind, it is a state and a federal swim lane that has got to marry up together. Okay, we got just a couple minutes left. Do we have any questions online, Jason? No? Okay. Uh, if you have a question, just keep it short or, or descriptive so I can repeat it, okay? Because we don't have a microphone out there so they can hear us online. So if anybody has any questions in the audience, feel free. You got a question? I have a comment. Okay. Okay. Um, going back to how the Congress and the Senate are feeling about what's happening to them right now, I think it's not only the fact that they are super short-staffed, they're losing patients, also seeing travelers come in that are getting three to four to five times their hourly pay. And even the community hospital where I live are giving their $10,000 sign-on bonus, which is great. It's fabulous. And I wish, but what I'd really like to see is we get the therapists that are working there that $10,000 mm -hmm. thank you for staying with us. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's a multiple thing. It's not just it's not just losing your patients and being overworked, it's still feeling underappreciated. And <coughs> you know, just, you know, they're, you guys are heroes, you're heroes. And, and I'm retired, but if I could work 12 hour shifts, I'd go back, not that anybody probably hired me more. But, Why? I love <laughs> Well, I'll shift, I'd be Alaska right now. You know, when they're getting like 5,000 a week. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's really two sides of the point. Yeah. Can you call five of that for our audience at home? Um, yeah, could they hear that? You got a, a room mic, right? Okay. I think they heard. Hopefully. Anybody else have a question or comment? If I've got 30 seconds on. Yes, please. To follow up on Colleen, but very important for So it is to make a rational, emotional case to your leadership or if you're in leadership to the hospital administration of the home care company, and you can do a return on the investment on uh, what it costs to replace people and, and educate yourself to emotion, to take the emotions out of it and put it to an ROI type of factor that. If you'll take that ten thousand dollars and spread it against us, and that's what we've been successful in to do that. You know, we're, we're having to do both. We're having to do retention bonuses and fund uh, bonuses, but that's not as painful as um, a safety issue. Not having patient care. Okay.
Well, thank you guys so much. I think this was great. This is a, a pretty awesome panel that we had up here. Uh, very impressive. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, back at 1.30, so we have lunch right now. Enjoy lunch. Hopefully the internet goes down so you'll get free lunch again. <laughs> and it comes back at 1.30.